Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to our service of worship this morning at the First Congregational Church of Boylston, as well as those watching on television later today or on the internet on Facebook. Um, the one on WBAC will run at 2 o'clock today. My name is Deb Larkin, and I am the worship leader today. Our organist and pianist is Charles Wachuku, and our minister is Pastor Ron Sylvester. The flowers this morning on the altar are given to the glory of God with thanks and praise for the confirmands who will soon become members of our church. If you wish to communicate with the church or Pastor Sylvester or leave a prayer request, please call the church office at 508 869-2027. And please remember to send in your pledges by mail if you do not feel comfortable coming to church. The church needs your continued support to meet its expenses. A few announcements this morning. Don't forget, there are hearing devices out in the narthex on the table, and they're fairly simple to run, but if you need help, just ask and somebody can help you to figure it out. Also, please check your bulletin for other announcements this morning. Um, we would also like to remind everyone to please join us downstairs after church for fellowship in the church hall. And now Pastor Ron has a few announcements to make. I, I do have an announcement this morning. These are uh, very troubling times that we live in. Uh, we are in the midst of a global crisis. And in times like these, it's important for the church to step forward and to serve the communities where they're situated. Very wisely, I want to tell you that your leadership, the SLT, decided on Wednesday that we ought to host a prayer vigil for our community and our area. And so we're going to do that on Thursday at our usual open house. So this Thursday at 7 o'clock, I would hope that all of you could join with us in this prayer vigil. It'll go for 45 minutes. After the prayer vigil, uh, we'll have refreshments, and we're going to be doing some uh, shamrocks. We're going to be making some shamrocks for the seniors in, in town. And you're welcome to participate in that as well. I need to let you know that we have invited six churches to join with us. And uh, we also put it on Facebook. And I, I know that as of Friday morning, we had well over 650 uh, views and uh, lots and lots of likes and interest. So I'm expecting that we're going to see a number of guests. It's important, therefore, that we be available to host those who are coming to join with us in this vigil. There's nothing more important that we can do than to be praying for an end to the war in Ukraine. So I hope you'll plan to join us. Please mark it and uh, make it possible if indeed uh, your schedule allows uh, to be here with us at 7 o'clock on Thursday for our normal open house time. It's going to be a prayer vigil for the end of the war in Ukraine. Thanks so very much. So please rise as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Inspire us, O God, open our hearts. Inspire us, O God, open our eyes. Inspire us, O God, open our ears. O God of love, vision, and truth, we come to worship you. And please join me in the invocation. Our gracious Heavenly Father, because of the truth about you and the love from you, we seek to come near to you. Receive us into your presence, speak truth to us, and manifest your love among us. Touch our lives so we are changed by your spirit. We pray this in the manner Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
you so much. We have some wonderful uh, things coming to us this morning in worship. It was just a couple of weeks ago that our young people went to a retreat at Camp Berea. Christian camps have always been such a special part of my Christian training and uh, my uh, love for the Lord. And uh, I, I got the sense that um, there were wonderful things spiritually that happened in the lives of our young people that were there at Berea. So it's going to be good for us to hear from a couple of them, a few of them, and uh, let's take some time and do that now. We're grateful that they're willing to do this. Michelle. Good morning. Um, we have wonderful news that we were able to go to Berea this year. The pandemic did not stop us. Uh, last year we had plans to go, but unfortunately um, we couldn't. We had a very small group. There were eight of us. Um, mainly because of some concerns about the pandemic and some students were traveling as well. Um, but we had an awesome time and I just wanted to update everyone. Um, we are up to 18 members of the youth group. I had two um, over February vacation. I had two families reach out and ask if their kids could join. So we're now up to 18 kids, which is pretty amazing. So I wanted to share that blessing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Molly Simler, and I'm part of the youth group here at church. The youth group attended Camp Berea this year, and there were many things we loved about it. My favorite part was our worship leader, Jen Aldana. Jen encouraged us to have a relationship with God and to always be ourselves. We are planning to see Jen again in Boston at the end of March, and we've invited her to come up to Boylston to share her message. I am Brennan. I also went to the went to Camp Berea. Um, some of the things that I liked was the hands-on activities that we did for learning about God. Um, General Donna singing, um, CZ. I forget his name, but he's a preacher and he preached at Camp Berea. His Preaches were very motivational. I also liked the activities that were held at Camp Rea. The tubing, there was games and activities <laughs> that were held, a whole championship thing. <laughs> you can show the slides in a minute. I don't want to breathe laughter. Um, Keep going, there, there were four teams which was like a few different church groups put together on a team. And then we had championship stuff. Um, the yellow team ended up winning. Our church was on the blue team. We were in second before the final championship match. Yellow was in third and then they somehow managed to rise up to first. <laughs> And there was also paintball. There was a giant swing, which got to like 50 feet up in the air at its max elevation. It's quite high. Um, it was just really fun in general. Um, now we're gonna be showing a slideshow that we put together. Machines were so 
go on. <laughs> That was us during one of the competitions. We all wore bandanas, <laughs> and you can see our shirts on. Um, this was one of the games that we, they had us play. I think it was like this like battle game yeah. where we went against like the red team. I forget what it was called. It was some sort of thing where you had to launch darts, and if you got hit <laughs> with a dart, you were out. And by the end of the match, you had to collect all the darts for your team. Nerf darts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, these are the darts. These were more moments during the matches. Um, this is just us, like, getting... Oh, wait, this is us at the um, volleyball tournament we were in. Um, we didn't really get very far, and the only game we won was because another team like forfeited. <laughs> <laughs> this was during that match with the darts. We had these little balls that we had to get into the bins and then there were some leaders that ended up getting pool noodles and they had to stay behind like this yellow line here but if you got hit with one of their pool noodles you were out. And so it was kind of hectic. <laughs> this was us playing the wacky balls game. Okay. Um, here's just some pictures of us during the first match. Oh, uh, this was in our the like lodge area, and they had a bunch of games that we could play. They had like um, carpet ball. That was two being the first night and then the first day. Um, you can see we're heading up the hill and then there's people sliding down the hill. They have closing the second hill, which was an S turn because somebody crashed on it the first night and fractured their foot. <laughs> that end up going in the blizzard, the the spot blizzard, very short but very snowy and windy. This is more people jumping in the water. Did any of you jump in the No. <laughs> <laughs> smart. This was the picture just before we started leaving. This was just this was at the top porch of the lodge, out to the lake. It was your jacket. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't need one. And then that's the girls in front of the lake on a little hexagon pad thing. Um, these were just like. Oh yeah, this was like at the beginning. We were like, there was nothing going on, and it just like started. That's more of the lake. That spot right there was the dive spot. They had a pump running so that did not freeze over. That's the end. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, Fred. That's great. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us. We've got a lot on on tap for this morning in worship as we continue. So I'm going to just ask that we go right into the praise and the petitions of God's people. It's your turn.
to speak to him. Let's pray. Father, you hear our every prayer, and you never fail us, and your answers to our prayers are what's best for us. We believe that, and we entrust ourselves to you, for you have blessed us beyond measure. We are rich in your blessings, and we praise you. For your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. This next time we spend together in worship is gathered around the Lord's table. And again, we emphasize it is the Lord's table, not the table of the First Congregational Church of Oilston. People from all over the world who love Christ gather around this table of his to remember, as he's told us we need to do, and we do need to remember the certain. This morning as we come to the table, I want us to think about a word that went out when the cannons had silenced and the gunfire ceased some number of years ago. And the word that went out was this, with malice toward none and charity toward all. You probably remember who said those words it was Abraham Lincoln. And he understood something that I think is very much in line with how God views war. You see, man views war this way. It's over when the enemy is defeated. But that's not how God views war. God views war this way. It's over when the enemy has become our friend. That's how God views war. John wrote this, and you know who it's about. Greater love has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. That's what's happened that's what we celebrate as we come to the table this morning. 
remembering that Jesus laid down his life for us, who really have been at enmity with him because of our sin. And because he died for us and made forgiveness possible for us, we can be his friends. Not just a defeated foe, but his friends. And even more than that, his children. So this morning, if you're a child of his because you accept the truth that Jesus died on that cross and paid the penalty that we deserve for our sins and gained us forgiveness, then please come and partake of these elements with us. God's view of war, it's not over when the enemy's defeated. It's over when the enemy has become our friend. Let's begin with self-examination. That's what we're told to do, to examine ourselves. There are still pockets of resistance in our lives to the God who loves us and died for us. So let's tell him in all honesty what those pockets of resistance are and ask his forgiveness. We begin with confession together. Let's recite it. Gracious Father in heaven and Lord of all, our lives remind us of the need to ask in honesty and humility for the forgiveness you have availed us by the shed blood of our Savior Jesus. We open our lives to you and acknowledge our faith has been wanting, even as your grace has been abundant. Hear now our personal confessions. Let's pray. Dear ones, hear these words of assurance. God is near to all who call, to all who call in truth. God hears their cry and saves them. Amen. On that night, when Jesus was betrayed, when he had given thanks, he took bread. He broke it, and he gave it unto them, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Eat ye all of it in remembrance of me. It was in a like manner that Jesus took the cup. And when he gave it unto them, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many unto the remission of sins. So drink ye all of it in remembrance of me.
Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, mere words like thank you aren't really sufficient in the face of what you did for us. Dying upon that cross, shedding your blood, making forgiveness available, and an abundant life with you. You are God, Emmanuel, and you love us. Even when we ourselves are unlovable, you are glorious, and you are sovereign. We look to you for all things. And indeed, we thank you for all our blessings. And Father, might we see those blessings as opportunity to share what you have done for us with others. Lord, we pray this morning for those who are in need. Some we know, many we don't. Particularly this morning, we want to lift up those who we are aware need your healing hand in their lives. So we think of Judith and Florence and Eddie and others, Heavenly Father. And Father, we pray that you would increase our desire to grow in our understanding of you and our relationship with you. We pray that you'd help us to increase in our desire for your will and your ways in our lives. That, Lord, we would increase in our compassion for those who are in need of any kind whatsoever. And we pray that you would show us and equip us to make a difference in the lives of those around us. Make the kind of contribution to their lives that you call us and you've equipped us to do. Father, we pray for the comfort and the help for those who are suffering, especially in Ukraine. We pray for the displaced, the families that are separated, for those serving in conflict. And Lord, we pray for wisdom for our leaders and for the world leaders as well. Father, we ask ultimately, because you are the Lord of history, for you to intervene with mercy and bring this horrific situation to a conclusion. Lord, we pray it all in your great and powerful and wonderful name, the name of Jesus. Amen.
Beautiful, thank you. The scripture reading this morning is from Habakkuk, and it's chapter 1, verses 1 to 13. It can be found as well as chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, and can be found in the Old Testament in page 974 and 975, and then 977. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw, the prophet's complaint, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not listen? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack, and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. Look at the nations and see. Be astonished, be astounded. For work is being done in your days that you would not believe if you were told. For I am rousing the clotted Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. Dread and fearsome are they, their justice and dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more menacing than wolves at dusk, their horses charge. Their horsemen come from far away, they fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence. With faces pressing forward, they gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and of rules they make sport. They laugh at every fortress, and heap up earth to take it. Then they sweep like the wind, they transgress and become guilty, and their own might is their God. Are you not from of old? O Lord my God, O Holy One, you shall not die. O Lord, you, you have marked them for judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for punishment. Your eyes are too pure to behold evil, and you cannot look on wrongdoing. Why do you look on the treacherous and are silent when the wicked swallow those more righteous than they? Through the fig tree does not blossom, though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights to the leader with stringed, instrument, stringed instruments. May the Lord bless this reading. Let's stand as we're able and let's sing hymn number 151, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Just the first and the third stanzas.
when one of our sons was just little, he had, and, and, and he had either done something wrong or been troubled about something. He would come to his mom, he would pull her down to him, and in his tiny voice he would say to her, Mommy, we need a talk. <laughs> Paula always knew that that was not a good sign. <laughs> Mommy, we need a talk. Can I tell you that that's the source of the title for our Lenten series that we're beginning today? a series that focuses on prayer. So the title of our series is God, We Need to Talk. We do need to talk to God, don't we? That's what prayer is all about. It's just a simple conversation with God. And we don't have to be in trouble. We don't even have to have done something wrong. We can talk with God and just tell him how grateful we are for all that he's done, for who he is, what he's like, and how he's demonstrated such interest in our lives and invested himself in our lives, in our circumstances. God, we need to talk. You know, as we said last week, I believe it was, Prayer is the greatest privilege that we have as Christians. And yet, who of us hasn't at one time or another wondered whether it really makes any difference at all? That thought has crossed our mind, hasn't it? Does prayer really make any difference at all? I suggest to you that that's where Habakkuk's mind was when he penned this prophecy that we just read part of. And he framed it with these words. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Follow along, if you will, in the scriptures there. Using the Pew Bibles or your Bible app, whatever you choose, but do you see that in the first verse of chapter 1? Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not listen. You see, he was wrestling with God in prayer. Sometimes that's what prayer is. Sometimes it's wrestling with God. Not unlike Jacob, wrestling with God. I want to give you a little bit of the background here. Habakkuk was a minor prophet. Now, we refer to 12 of the prophets in the Old Testament as minor prophets simply because their works are shorter in length. And there were 12 of them. And Habakkuk wrote his prophecy probably around 605 or 603 B.C., before Christ. And the northern kingdom, Israel, had already fallen to a powerful enemy, Assyria. And it had fallen because they themselves had pursued idolatry and languished in evil. But sadly, the southern kingdom, Judah, where Habakkuk himself lived and served God, didn't learn anything from the lesson watching the fate of the northern kingdom, Israel. Josiah was the last great king of Judah that was good. He initiated reforms and he honored God. But after him, the nation again forgot God. And around 603 B.C., Habakkuk describes the character of the nation. Look at verses 2 and 3. Destruction and violence are before me. 
strife and conflict abound. So much so that the law is paralyzed or slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround, you might say, outnumber the righteous and judgment is perverted. You see, that description is what becomes of a nation that forget God, of a people that forget God. Oh, and sadly, I have to say that it sounds like a description of our country, our nation today. Habakkuk says, how long will I cry or, or pray for help? And you will not listen, God. A prayer of desperation. And God answers him in verses 5 through 11 of chapter 1. And you'll notice, especially in verse 5, what he says. He says, God is at work. I'm at work. And what's he doing? What is his work? It's astonishing. He's, a, he's rousing the Chaldeans, which is really another name for the Babylonians. He's rousing them to eventually capture Judah, just as the Assyrians had the northern kingdom, Israel. That was going to happen. That was not yet to be, but within 20 years or so, it would occur. In 586, Jerusalem was sacked, and all the Jews were exiled to Babylonia. It was the beginning of the great exile. Habakkuk had prophesied it. But when Habakkuk heard God's answer to his prayer, about his silence, about the fact that he's working to rouse the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, it prompted a second question. And that second question is, why do you allow even those that are more wicked than my own nation victory? Why would you do this? Have those who are worse off than we are Have victory over us. You see, there was at least a remnant in Judah that loved God and were faithful to him. So why would a totally ungodly nation like the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, be allowed victory over them? And God answers that second question, explaining that these wicked ones from Babylonia would themselves be judged and punished. And that's what chapter 2 is all about. God says to Habakkuk, note in chapter 2, verse 3, if it seems to tarry, wait, for it will surely come. If it seems to tarry, wait, for it will surely come. Habakkuk hears God, and he believes him, and he does what God says. He waits upon God. You know what waiting requires? It requires faith. That's what waiting requires. And look at what verse 4 says in chapter 2. Because it's the critical verse in Habakkuk. The righteous live by faith. This became Paul's motto for the letter of the, to the Romans. The righteous shall live by faith. And Habakkuk gives us a description of what faith looks like. Look at chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Do you see that? It very clearly states what faith looks like. Faith looks like, though, in fact, the fig tree doesn't blossom, and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive tree fails, and the fields yield no food. Though the flock is cut off from the fold, 
and, and there's no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll exult in the God of my salvation. That, my friends, is faith. And that faith is built through waiting in prayer. God's timing and prayer go together. They really do. By faith, through prayer, Habakkuk was, was, was transformed. He was changed from a warrior to a worshiper. How many of us need to be transformed by prayer and faith from a warrior to a worshiper like Habakkuk was? He didn't challenge God when there wasn't an immediate answer. He didn't just throw up his hands and walk away from God. The reason Habakkuk grew in his faith was through prayer. He watched and listened. He knew that God would reveal and accomplish his will. He doesn't know when. He doesn't know how. But he knew it in faith. When Habakkuk took his eyes off the circumstances and, and looked instead to God and watched and listened to God in prayer, his faith was built Prayer changed Habakkuk into a faithful man. And he can do it in our lives as well. There's one reason that God's timing is important in prayer. And that is to build our faith. Our perspective is limited. Our desires are so self-seeking. Our, our needs are so, so imminent. Sometimes the question we ask in prayer, when, Lord, is in reference to something very simple. But more often it refers to a hope for the alleviation of a difficult, trying circumstance in our lives a serious illness that we suffer, a dilemma at work, a financial struggle, a relational issue, or a global crisis. Can I tell you this? Stress makes us believe everything has to happen now. That's what stress does for us. It makes us believe that everything's going to happen now. Debbie Probliski offers a, a, a common progression. She, she unfolds what she sees as a common progression when stress is high and prayer is critical. She says we begin with fervency, employing lots of time and attention and energy to bring the need before God. Oh, God. And then... As time passes and we haven't received an answer, we ask, like Habakkuk did, how long? And, and we become vulnerable to frustration and anger and disappointment and disillusionment even with God, with the situation, with ourselves. And this, thirdly, makes us pray, P-R-E-Y, makes us pray to the lies of the enemy. Your faith is inadequate. God doesn't care. He, the enemy, will attack us, even at the point when God is building our faith with his timing. But we continue in prayer, she says. And then, almost like a light dawning, we see some revelation from him. His work, his will is revealed. That's what happened for Habakkuk. When God explained, listen, I am at work. It seems that I'm silent. It seems that nothing's happening, but I am at work. 
And here's what's going on. So God revealed his work and his will to Habakkuk, and he does the same for us. And when that happens for us, after we've persevered in prayer, after we've accepted his timing, then our faith is strengthened. And we don't act on feelings. And we're able to wait as long as necessary with faith, like Habakkuk. If stress makes us feel or believe that everything has to happen now, then faith makes us believe everything will happen in God's time. And prayer is the vehicle that gets us to that mindset. Three lessons that are helpful and we're done. First, our God is the Lord of history. The governing of God is is integrated with the governments of men. And everything that occurs in history has a place in God's divine plan. We may not understand it. We may not like it. But everything that happens in history has a place in God's divine plan. Our God is the Lord of history. Second lesson, it's necessary not only to believe in God, but to believe in God's timing as well. His timing is perfect. And thirdly, God's timing makes opportunity for us to pray and thus build our faith. And the righteous shall live by faith. Is that how we are living? And is it because we've learned the power, the importance, the place of prayer in our lives? Let's pray now. Father, teach us from what Habakkuk gave us in his prophecy and you've preserved for us about prayer and timing from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's conclude our worship by singing together Hymn number 428, In Christ There Is No East or West. Shall we stand? it is for us to be here as hosts for this prayer vigil that we've invited other churches and our community to. They need us to take some leadership in this this week. So let's be here and do it, okay? Now hear the benediction. To the God of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. God bless you all. Bye.
I think God bless.